Uh, thank you for introduction. Hi, my name. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, um, thank you for uh, Dr. Jumian uh, for inviting me. Um, that I'm sorry for not being being able to be there today. Uh, so. I'm a palliative care physician, uh, probably only one uh, in this room right now, today. And uh, I have been uh, taking care of many patients in the situation that uh, with no exit strategy. So I'd like to uh, talk uh, about how to approach to this very difficult uh, situation. So um, when we start uh, ECMO or mechanical circuitry support, uh, the indication uh, we think about is a bridge to recovery, bridge to transplant, or a bridge to airbag. Uh, sometimes it happens very quickly, so we call that a bridge to decision. These are interchangeable. Um, unfortunately, sometimes um, those options are not available, uh, so it becomes a bridge to nowhere. How often does it happen? Uh, in the database, it happens about more than half of the cases. And the uh, uh, paper shows uh, many patients die uh, with organ failure within a week or two. Uh, but some cases that the family make a request that uh, uh, to stop the MCS, the ECMO. So um, many, the first uh, question we face is, uh, I often hear is uh, in bridge to nowhere situation, are you comfortable with discussing uh, MCS withdrawal? So um, we are not comfortable. Uh, this is a study, uh, this is a questionnaire to uh, the cardiologists who deal with airbag and uh, uh, who feel comfortable uh, with turning off the airbag at end of life uh, less than 30%. And, uh, 13% of the cardiologists feel uh, it's the same as you know, euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. And uh, they feel different uh, in, uh, with stopping you know, the uh, mechanical ventilation or IV uh, fluid or nutrition. So let's talk about the definition of euthanasia or PAS. Uh, euthanasia is an act that intentionally causes death in someone who is very sick or suffering. PAS is a uh, you know, physician help the patient in taking his or her own life by intentionally providing lethal dose of medication with knowing that the patient might commit suicide. In both cases, this intentionally is the key. So how is it different? We have to think about two things. One is a physician's intent. In withdrawal, uh, our intent is not to hasten the death. We know the time is going to be short, but our primary intention is to remove the burdensome treatment. And more importantly, uh, after a patient dies, uh, we need to think, so what, kill, what caused the death? In withdrawal, uh, what caused the death is the underlying disease, such as cardiogenic shock or multi-system organ failure. On the other hand, PAS or euthanasia, the medication or intervention we provided, that is going to cause the death. So because of these two reasons, um, there's a clear distinction between those two, medically, ethically, and legally. So basic ethical principles, uh, as long as the burden outweighs the benefit, patients have the right to refuse any kind of treatment, uh, even if they once agreed with it. And uh, withhold and withdrawal is the same. This right is not unique. Uh, what that means is that withdrawal of the ECMO is the same as stopping the other type of life support. So this is the first uh, point I want to make. The next is, uh, uh, okay, we understand the, uh, it's, uh, it's different from PAS or euthanasia, but now when can we stop ECMO? And how can we talk to patient and family? So this is the uh, next uh, difficulty. So, I want to share uh, how uh, I or you know, palliative care clinicians approach to this situation. Uh, we call this, I mean, I call this a three-stage protocol. And the uh, first stage is uh, you know, sharing knowledge. Second stage is clarifying goals of care. And the third stage is negotiating treatment options. I go to the second stage only after I clear the first stage. 
and I go to the third, third stage only after I share the, I create the second stage. So first stage, uh, sharing knowledge. This is where we need to explain to the patient and the family the medical situation. Why you get so sick? Why you are not a candidate for the uh, uh, transplant or ELBA? Um, after explaining those, um, we need, I need to be on the same page with the patient and the family with one single information. What is it? That is uh, prognosis. And uh, prognosis means what is going to happen next. We need to uh, convey that to the patient and the family. And in the case of bridge to nowhere situation, what we need to tell them is uh, um, MCS can keep the current condition, uh, but only in the ICU. And uh, no matter how hard we try, uh, that is the time frame they have left is only days, in the range of days to weeks. Once you uh, convey this information, you clear the first stage. Very common pitfall we fall in here is that then uh, you start asking questions like, uh, do you want to continue ECMO? Do you want CPR? Or do you want a blood transfusion? Do you want pressors? So uh, this, this, we start asking uh, these uh, yes, no questions, and this is wrong. What is happening here is uh, you are trying to jump to the third stage without creating the second stage. We just shared the poor prognosis. So we need to clarify the goal based on that prognosis. So here, the second stage, clarifying goals of care. I cannot emphasize this more. This is missing all the time. We don't ask these questions. So what are the questions you should ask to explore goals? The questions we need to ask. Probably this is the slide, the most important uh, in my whole presentation. You can forget everything else, but I want you to remember the, these questions today. So question is this, like, what is important to him? What are you hoping for? And uh, what are you most worried? And uh, tell me about him. You can be broader, tell me about him. What kind of person is he? And uh, what makes his life meaningful? You ask these questions and uh, let them talk and listen. Generally, uh, we have uh, uh, three pathways in this situation. The family might say, you know, he suffered enough. Uh, we don't want to see him suffer anymore. Just let, just let him die peacefully. If in this case, uh, we recommend uh, withdrawal, stopping the life support, including, uh, you know, mechanical circuit support or mechanical ventilation or pressors. <coughs> Some families say, you know, we hope for a miracle. You know, we don't want to believe what doctors are telling us. So we hope for a miracle in that case, uh, we continue the life support. Sometimes families say, you know, we know he's dying, but, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable to, uh, we don't want to pull the plug, or, you know, it's too much. We need time to consider. If they say that, uh, we can continue the life support, but uh, we can also bring up, or we can agree on not escalate the level of life support, or we can agree, you know, not add the new treatment. And uh, we can, uh, limit the tests or interventions. The point I'm trying to make here is that once you clear the second stage and once you have these goals, uh, all the answers come automatically. So you don't have to ask a lot of yes, no questions to each medical intervention. So this three stage protocol, uh, important thing is that you need to clear the second stage. So conclusion is uh, mechanical circuitry support has unique characteristics and it poses challenges in bridge to nowhere. However, the basic escal principles are the same as the other type of life support and uh, close communication about goals of care uh, stage, second stage is crucial. Thank you for your attention. probably the best seven minutes of palliative care I've ever uh, listened to. Uh, really impressive. Uh, does anybody want to make a comment about their experiences or Eddie? So, Dr. 
Dr. Nakagawa, that was incredible. Um, the one question I have, if the patient is not a candidate, the family keeps sometimes asking us, even in the midst of clear wishes otherwise by the patient, what's the likelihood he could recover with more time? So, you know, recovery is a big area um, in our field. And, and what, what I do is I tend to let them know that they are basically um, not without hope, but I let them know that recovery doesn't mean any quality of life could ensue even if it did in the case where that applies. How do you deal with that possibility where someone could recover? Which is always, um, for example, a young man who's got basically, you know, no heart function after an awful viral myocarditis, but, but after a month could, could recover. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. That's, uh, uh, that's a very uh, good question, and uh, we struggle all the time. And uh, I think when we hear the recovery, uh, or can he get better, I think we have to ask the question, what do you mean by the recovery? And uh, what uh, uh, better means, what do you mean by better? So, um, you know, everybody has different goals and values. And uh, what makes his or her life meaningful is different. Um, you know, some people might say, what makes my life meaningful is, uh, you know, uh, playing golf. Or, uh, you know, to be able to get out of the bed and walk around, that makes my life meaningful. Some people might say, uh, you know, for me, I enjoy food. Uh, eating makes my life meaningful. So um, if I have to live with the feeding tube for the rest of my life, I don't want to live like that, that's not life for me. So, um, or well, some people say, you know, my most important thing is my family. Even if I become bedbound, as long as I'm able to communicate, uh, I'm as long as I'm able to have a meaningful conversation, uh, I don't want to. I, I can I can take it. Uh, so you have to. That that's a, a reason why I emphasize the uh, uh, you know second stage, and uh, um, everybody is different and. Uh, you have to, uh, and then, you know, medical situation changes uh, every, you know, the, uh, uh, every moment. So you have to have a, uh, this uh, sensitive conversation from the get-go. Um, sometimes the people uh, think about the palliative care as, uh, you know, only at the end of life. That's a very common misconception. And, uh, you know, we never say never in medicine. But uh, I think I have one exception for that. You know, it's never too early to have the conversation. Um, I, can, I can say very, I, I want to make a point of that. Is there, Dr. Corey, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just thinking because he's right. What we get into trouble is the menu card syndrome, which I called. You know, these days with cardiogenic shock, we have a vast array of devices we can bring to bear on that patient. And last one and a half days, we've been discussing as experts, we don't know whether they work, they don't work. And we are offering those therapies to very sick people. At what point do we start talking to them that this is going to work, not work? What do we tell them up front? What is the role of these devices? And what point do we say we're not going to escalate care? There's always the next device which we could do. Start with a balloon pump. No, no, it's not working. Let's put an impeller. Impeller not working. Let's go for something bigger, ECMO. Where does it stop and uh, how does palliative care start helping us from that point of view? Uh, I think uh, in, in Colombia, uh, we, our team have a good relationship with the ICU and the CT surgeons, the ECMO team. So we get about like a half, like 50% of the cases we get called. And uh, when we look at the, uh, the the cases, the 50 percent which we are not called, uh, those cases were the time on the, MC, the ECMO or MCS was very short, like uh, either, I think two days or four days. Uh, during that, I mean, those uh, cases we didn't come in, um, probably because they either get better too quickly or they die uh, very, very quickly. So those cases, um, we don't struggle too much. 
the more difficult cases is uh, if the you know, time of the MCS becomes like a weeks, uh, 10 days, two weeks. Um, so if uh, you feel that uh, this time, the time on the MCS is getting longer, like several days or more, then I think you start to think about involving palliative care. Or, I mean, it depends on the institution that palliative, palliative care team the, might not be available. In that case, um, you know, ICU team or whoever can start asking these questions. Um, we, you know, these questions, uh, the second stage questions, um, I think it's interesting. That's the most important question, but it does not require any medical degree, any medical training. Everybody can ask those questions, and, uh, but still we, don't, we are not asking these questions. I think we have one other question, but I just want to say that for our, at our institution, every ECMO, every VAD, every pre-VAD gets a automatic order for palliative care consultation at the very beginning. So oh, that's that we, fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I, I think that's key that palliative care is core to the team. I think the only worse scenario than bridge to nowhere is bridge to nowhere with mixed messaging. And so I, I'm very interested in your feedback at the Cleveland Clinic very similar protocol, but it's with protocol one is a team meeting, ICU, heart failure, surgical service, to say, okay, do we all agree we're going nowhere? That would be a fundamental. And then that in, that influences the messaging to the family. And then you go through the protocol. So how, how what do you suggest? How do you approach it in terms of um, the team dynamic? Uh, I think I, I agree with you that uh, uh, before uh, starting the first stage, uh, I mean, medical side have to be agree on the, uh, medical side has to be on the same page. So, I mean, uh, usually there are, you know, 10 or 15, 20 physicians are involved in the care. And uh, all the party, the cardiology team, CT surgeon team, ICU team, and they all have to agree that, uh, you know, this is a bridge to nowhere. If uh, usually, you know, the one of the uh, uh, cardiologists um, don't feel that way, then usually that, um, I think we have to wait until all the team member uh, in agreement that, uh, okay, this is bridge to nowhere. I think we have to have the more serious conversation. That, I think that's the first stage. And then once a medical team on the same page, then we start to approach to the, you know, the family about the serious conversation. But uh, even before the uh, team member, medical side become the, uh, on the same page, we should start talking to the family. You know, this is the situation. And then the patient, uh, your loved one needs a, a ECMO and a breathing machine now. And also kidneys getting worse. And uh, you know we are hoping uh, this is this is what we are hoping, but uh, this is a barrier uh, we have to go through. So those uh, um, close communication is the key. You need to start early, and uh, if it gets prolonged, uh, we propose usually have the uh, like weekly family meeting. Um, you know usually the uh, ICU team or cardiology team updates the family like every day. But those updates is today is better than yesterday, or today the white count is better, or so those you know the uh, very uh, mind, I mean a small uh, detailed update. But uh, every week or maybe every two weeks or so, we should have the uh, sit down meeting uh, to look at uh, take a step back and look at the big picture. That was a great question and a great answer. So uh, we could talk about this for a long time, but uh, the bar and dinner is waiting. So I'd really like to thank the speakers for the great talks. I'd like to thank the panel, and I'd like to thank all you for hanging in there.